So Dick was there in 1977 speaking at this very prestigious event, and he goes off on – in fact, the, the title of his talk, I looked into this, if you find this world bad, you should see some of the others. <laughs> That's what he called it. Yeah. Can Sorry. I – do you mind if I just describe this? Please. My, so Please. he – he talks over his different personal because I just rewatched it. There's the long version and the short version. So he he talks over his theories about what, what the things that he has written about in the past. So what he calls counterfeit worlds. And he said, you know, these are people who remaining in their own world or drawn into other worlds. He's, he's talking about like realities that each person lives within but that other people don't live within and this is him talking about he says this is in some of my past work these are my themes and this is a quote that came right out of this he he said he's talking about the manifold of partially actualized realities lying tangent to what evidently is the most actualized one the one which the majority of us by consensus gentium he says agree on and then what he's basic that he says is <clears throat> he he based he didn't realize in the past, but that a lot of his writing and he references the man in the high castle and then another mm -hmm. novel, which from 1974, which I hadn't read, but talks about a future American police state or a different American police state. And keep in mind, he's talking in the 1970s. And he yeah, said, can I just say that one was called Flow My Tears? The policeman said, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So he had had dental surgery and was under drugs. He was kind of knocked out. <laughs> under the influence, yeah. He Sodium was. pentanol. Sodium, yes. Pentothal. Pentothal. And he said, look, but I am telling you, this was a vision that I had, and I'm convinced it was real, that I was able to see that there was this other reality that I had experienced. He said, this isn't a past life. This is different from a past life. And one of the things he says here, this is a quote that I actually pulled off of another article that was quoting this statement here. He says, we are living in a computer programmed reality. So now we're getting into like the matrix. He said, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. Might as well have said a glitch in the matrix. Uh, uh, it's the first thing I thought of when I heard yeah, that. Exactly. He says these alterations feel just like deja vu. He says the sensation that proves that, quote, a variable has been changed and an alternative world branched off. He says people claim to remember past lives. I claim to remember a different, very different present life. I know of nobody who has ever made this claim before, but I rather suspect that my experience is not unique. What perhaps is unique is my willingness to talk about it. We are living in a program computer program reality and um where i just uh, quoted that before so and he said it took him uh three years to get up enough nerve to admit that this was true yeah. he, for, he for also him. yes he also said he had a series of religious experiences i don't know if this is related to his uh dental surgery or not. it was all in 1974 so i mean the thing about it is he's got on this at this stage in France and all of these people there and they all admire him. And he says, look, I'm not joking. I had this experience and I know that I've experienced these other present realities, not past life. So essentially alternate realities. Mm -hmm. Simultaneous. Yeah. And it's not clear that people believed him. There's a couple of clips when you see people in the audience are like, uh, really now? Like, I don't really think they knew how to take it, but he was dead serious. I think. Oh, yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, that's why I think it's worth actually watching the clip because you can see mm -hmm. the concern and almost the struggle in his demeanor, you know, and that deep pressing desire to have some sort of validation like this has been haunting him, you know. Uh, exactly. Very seriously. And he claims these were memories. He said a fragment came in with all this information originally when he got his wisdom teeth out with that drug. But and he said he knew a lot when it all came in. But then I think it was later that day or maybe just a little bit later, the memories started flooding in like he oh, felt. That's it, what it was. Okay, yeah. yeah, he sort of felt that it unlocked it and they started coming in. 
I just want to offer up for people who are familiar with the Monroe Institute and Bob Monroe, he calls this a rote, R-O-T-E, when you would receive some sort of information and you would it would just be like you get a picture, but then all of this, it unravels with all of this information around it. It's, th- he had to name it uh, because it was, mm. it's, you know, there are these things that we need to be able to talk to each other about these, uh, e- these abstract concepts. And that was one, a rote. It's just this one thing, but it, but it comes apart in, into these memories of something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So just throwing it out. That's interesting. So he, Dick wasn't the only person who obviously was speculating about this. And then, you know, and on, on this website, a couple of years ago, you talked about your very interesting experience. We did it uh, back in 2018. We talked about this on the website about the, the so-called man on the, on the beach. Yeah. And that got a fair amount of <clears throat> interest on our site at the time. I think a lot of people were interested in this story of yours. Do you want to just recount it a little bit? Sure. I, I mean, I'm going to just preface this by saying I'm going to recount it as best that I can. And unfortunately, for those of you who've been members this whole time and remember that story when I first told it, I didn't have all of the details, but I have I have it written in a journal in great detail. I believe I wrote about 14 pages on this because I didn't want to forget it. Oh, my it. God. We've got to get you to read that. <laughs> yes. And I had called a friend who you know, Carol, because I felt the need to tell someone everything, every single piece of it immediately, you know, to sort of preserve the memory and to help myself, uh, okay, you know. Yeah. Right. So I, I told her everything and I didn't know what to make of it myself. So I tell this story and I have not made a judgment on it, but and no, I do, you do your best here. I mean, yeah, this I will. Place I in will. 2016. So it's yeah. not ancient history. No, no, it wasn't that long ago. And I can tell you where I was. So mm-hmm. at the time I was living in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, if any of you know the area, I was living near this beach, sort of the uh, northeastern part of St. Petersburg, near this beach. And there was a bridge you could drive over that goes over to Tampa. But right before, there's a beach that you can drive on. And I loved it when I lived there. I totally took advantage of it. You know, I went down there every day and uh, had my coffee down there and just, I felt so appreciative of that beach. You know, it was, it's not gorgeous. It's just at the side of a road, but man, it's, it was nice, you know? So this is where it took place. I would sometimes go back there later in the day and go for sort of a walk, a faster walk, like an exercise walk, you know? But this, this incident played such it stuck in my memory so much that I remember exactly what I was wearing you know and any visuals around this memory I I completely remember but that's like me so anyhow I was uh, at this beach late in the day I remember how the sun was you know the sun was lower and I was trucking along walking along I had a sweatshirt a hoodie over the hood was up my hair was pulled back I had a scarf on and uh, to stay warm. It was windy. I'm walking along. And all of a sudden, for some reason, I look to my left. And this man, who is a little ways off, but towards the water, at the water's edge, looks straight at me and starts walking to me super fast with this strong intent, right? And I'm like, oh, great. That's honestly what I was thinking. Like, oh, oh, no. You know, because I... Mm -hmm. I I want to go on my exercise walk, you know, (laughs) he comes over and uh, this strangest discussion that I never would have anticipated ensued. Basically, he told me he was from somewhere else and slowly unraveled the story that he wasn't from here, that he was from an alternate universe. Like, but he didn't use those words. I can't remember what words he used. And he proceeded to tell me that he was clearly distraught because he was misplaced. He was telling me he's not supposed to be here. He doesn't belong Mm -hmm. in this one. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, our reaction would be, this person is crazy. But for some reason, I was reserving that reaction. I thought I'm going to hear him out because there were certain... 
You said he was very well dressed. Yes, yes. That's what I was going to say. There were certain mm-hmm. factors. <clears throat> it, I mean, it was very confusing because who the man who stood before me looked like a very well kept, fit, tanned, quaffed businessman. Okay, so let, let's just do the physical description here. So he was about the same height as me. I, I would say around five eight, maybe five nine. I don't know. We were on a beach, you know, mm-hmm. so I can't really tell. But you know what I mean? He wasn't super tall. It was around my height. He was wearing perfect dress pants. He was wearing a perfect, crisp, bright white business shirt. Okay. He was tanned, like not over tanned, just nicely tanned. He was you know, a, a, a good looking man. Mm-hmm. Um, he, his hair was perfect. He had a full head of hair. He was about, I, I'm going to guess, I never know people's age anymore. I, I don't even think about age between 37 and 45, you know, he was somewhere in there, like prime of life kind of thing. One thing I noticed when he, when we were walking away was the back of his hair was super fresh. A long time ago, I used to work in a salon as a booker. And I you remember this. I'm going to explain it. Uh. When, when I worked in the salon and men would come in for a fresh cleanup, they would call it. You could always tell because the back of their neck was perfectly groomed. Uh. And he, he was perfectly groomed like he had just done this. Okay. So everything about him psychologically, uh, I'm assessing as very normal. And it's not like he's saying, Oh my God, I'm from this alternate, you know, he wasn't acting crazy in any way. He was, what do you remember him actually saying if to the best of your memory, he was telling me that he wasn't supposed to be here that, and I was calmly asking him, you know, uh, I just thought I'm going to ask him as many questions as I can um, and just see what his answers are like if I end up thinking he's crazy. And the more I asked, the, the more normal he sounded, to be honest, um, except his answers were unusual. He said uh, he was from somewhere else, that he wasn't supposed to be here, that um, he felt I asked, well, well, how can that be? And he's why? Why would that be? And he said I was. I feel it was a punishment uh, for something that I did. And I can't remember if he told me. I don't think he did. Tell me what it was. And I asked him, you know, what can you explain to me what the difference, what some of the differences are, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, okay. So he was looking on the beach. He said, see these two towers right here on, on either end of the beach. They had those big sort of, you know, those giant metal towers that hold like, wires across them what do you call those power cell phone lines. towers 5G power or, lines yeah, they were okay. like like they look like big power line towers yeah, like the right. really tall ones right mm-hmm. um and uh, he said those two towers don't exist on the beach here okay. they don't they don't exist where i live so that was that was one thing on, like but were, on he was saying on this beach like this i'm from here beach. but not here That's this exact right. beach in my he, reality doesn't have those those towers yeah. He's saying it it looks the same, but there's differences. For example, these yeah. two towers do not exist. I remember I was asking him about his family, and he was saying he was telling me some differences of how families that uh, were just a little different that they valued different things. I can't remember what those values were, but it was something. I remember he made a comment about uh, how we treat animals and how we. Here we have to struggle so much to for our careers, and we everybody's living off of debt. And the sort of uh, impression in my mind that's left over is that it was easier in general for people to make a living. It wasn't such a struggle there in his world. In his world, yeah. and that there was something to do with animals, like a really, really positive a treatment of animals. Um, you know, there were actually some cases where I was making an argument against what he was saying. You know, when he was saying something bad about this place, I found myself actually defending it with a, you know, like, well, there's many cases where we we look after our our own and we do this and, you know, so, but but just imagine we're having this debate. I'm defending this world against the world he's talking about, you know? Yeah, yeah. How, how unusual is that? Um, 
Right. It's uh, like a very well dressed, fit, nice looking man who seems intelligent, who's telling you he's from a different place. It looks like I, this place, but it isn't this place. Yeah. And I just want to tell people, you know, like I know a lot of you know, a lot of my background is psychology. So I'm assessing this guy. And I was also in university uh, completing that part of my degree, you know, so yeah. I am I'm going through all of this in my mind. And like I am marking off the check boxes like this guy seems completely sane. He seems grounded. He seems, you know, like there was nothing I could find that was telling me that he was delusional, living in a fantasy, playing a trick on me. Uh, I, I couldn't find a hint of everything. And the the strange part about me is that I basically sat there and interviewed the heck out of him trying to, I guess part of me was trying to trip him up and another part of me was like, well, hey, if if there's any chance in the world that this is true, I really want to know these things. You know? Did he tell you did he tell you how long he'd been in this world? I remember it wasn't remember. very long. Yeah. I I know that he was really unhappy and wanted to get back. Yeah. And he felt stuck. And um, he didn't what a bizarre know bizarre meeting. He didn't so know bizarre. what to do, and yeah. I felt there was no way to help him. Um, it's almost like if you meet someone who's really, you know, they just stepped out of a. I mean, this is not going to say this, but they, let's just say they a businessman just steps out of a Mercedes, but suddenly he's he can't find his keys or something. And so he's distraught. You know, he's looking around. He's distraught, but he's calm. It was like that, you know, uh-huh, uh-huh. it was okay. if you guys can imagine that yeah. you had a follow up meeting with this guy like a week later. Yeah. I just want to tell you one more thing before I tell you that. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I remember one <laughs> tiny little other thing that he looked at me before we parted and he said, what are those spots on your neck? Like I got freckles all over me, but he was really fixated on them. And he, he was like, is that some form of disease or something like that and i was like no that as a matter of fact yes <laughs> it's like it's actually just normal it's it's all over my body but even just the fact that he looked at that like that he was looking at everything through these ever so slight childlike eyes he wasn't acting childlike but he was asking questions sort of like a like a scientist who's seeing brand new things it it was mm. I'm I'm just yeah. trying to impress how unusual this was. I hope I've done an, a decent job. I mean, someday I'll find this in my journal, I promise you guys, and I will tell that you. That would be, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, we, I we know. We need you to do that. Well, so I don't you, have then you run into him. Right now. Okay, so, so. You ran into him a week I, later. I. By chance. Well, I didn't say a week later. I can't remember, but very soon oh. after this. So okay. I leave, I go and tell my friend everything. Um, and. You know, because I just I cannot get this out of my head. I don't know what to think of about it. I write about it, everything. So it was within the next week. I mean, it's very soon after this happened. By weird chance, I am going over to Tampa. Now, I never go over the bridge to Tampa. I don't know my way around in Tampa at the time. I I I never go over there. I just happened to be doing it because I was going to have a blood draw for a test I wanted to have done, Mm -hmm. um, food sensitivity or something crazy like that. So I head over there. I can't remember the exact circumstances, but I realized I went early in the morning. I wanted to go before everyone. And I think it was something like either I missed the turnoff and I couldn't find it or it was closed, or there was something happened, right? So, and also, I asked you about this beforehand, and you said this was like a last, kind of like a last minute decision. You you called the place very quickly to see if yeah, they were something available, like that. and then like you just were out the door. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah. yeah, and I don't, I don't think I called them. I didn't call them the day of. So I go over there anyhow. Whatever happens, I either arrived at it. Or or I couldn't find it. One of the two. I can't remember. But if I arrived there, I thought, oh, no, I'm going to go. I'm going to go get a coffee or I'm going to. I don't know. I just I know I was trying to leave and I got lost. Not only did I get lost, I got lost for an hour. You know, I was driving all over the place. I was 
completely lost. Like my GPS was not working or something, you know? So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. anyhow, I just, I was so frustrated. You know, you're so frustrated and you're sweating, you know? And then I had to go to the bathroom. I just wanted a Starbucks so I could have a bathroom and get a coffee, whatever. So I'm just trying to find the nearest Starbucks and everything just seemed against me having this smooth experience. Like I get into this giant parking lot. I can't find anywhere to park. I've never been to this place before. I just landed here. Okay. I landed Mm -hmm. at this place. Um, I almost didn't even go in because of the traffic, just trying to park to get in there, this Starbucks. So I go in and it is the biggest Starbucks I have ever seen. Massive. I, I, to this day, I've never seen one like this. I mean, there could have been a hundred people in there. There were so many chairs. It's so different. Um, And so I ran straight through the door and straight down and because there was a a bathroom there. And um, so do that, come back, talk to someone really quickly. And then uh, I think I was asking directions or where I was or something. I I can't remember. So I'm walking back out toward out the door and sitting at a chair that flanked the door, there was a chair on either side, was the guy. And he just doesn't, he just gives this tiny little smile and this tiny nod, like of acknowledgement, like, "Mm -hmm." Mm mm-hmm, just like that. And I was so freaked out (laughs) that I I just left. I didn't know what to do because I thought, what? I wish I could show people how he acknowledged me like this there was you know when something weird happens and it might look normal in reality but everything in you senses it feels weird like it just it felt so strange Uh, listen I didn't know where I was I didn't know where I was how could I have what are the odds that he would have been there in Tampa's a big city it's not it's not like New York City or LA but it's big and for you just to run into him at this Starbucks. Where I was lost and ran into that Starbucks. It happened to be very close to where you needed to be, but you didn't know it. At the I time. had no idea. Yeah. When I started to that's find my way out of there. That's yeah. a very strange thing. So, like, I mean, it makes me really wonder if I don't know who this guy was or if they were someone was playing you in some way. Like, yeah, th- that's the thing. I stayed with him but long why enough would they do to that? try to determine whether he was playing with me. And I will yeah. tell you, I was on him. I was not distracted. I was on him, asking him questions, watching his behavior, watching his eyes, watching his body language. Like I was on him. And right. there was not a sign that he was lying, making it up, tricking me. Uh, he didn't seem impatient. He didn't seem like he was looking around to see if other people were nothing. He was so yeah. focused. So just Maybe, the fact that he was. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go. I just wanted to say the one of the questions I walked away from this was why did he choose me? Because he just bolted for me uh, when I looked over, like, was I the only person there? Like, how could how could you trust someone, you know, to say this to them? Yeah. Because right, he came out of the blue and just started telling you that he wasn't from here. Yeah, I mean, and it wasn't like, like I was saying, it wasn't like he was being sensational. Like if someone mm-hmm. was, you know, just escaped from a crazy place, you know, it wasn't yeah. like he was. There was there was no sense of that at all. He was talking to me like you're talking to me now, like super calm, a little bit weary of what I would think, yeah. but but yeah. very matter of fact, you know? It's very strange. Uh he didn't act like he was on anything either. Like the, you know, his eyes, he didn't act like he was on anything. He was speaking to me directly in the eyes. He wasn't fidgety. He wasn't there was nothing, I'm telling you. Well, what's kind of weird. So there's two different things about this that make This is why I was wondering if we would talk about this today, because we've been chatting about the Philip K. Dick thing and his idea, his I mean, it seemed like Dick personally believed that there were alternate realities that he definitely does. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that we had the ability to occasionally get glimpses of. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. And your experience with this mysterious man on the beach does seem to harken to that idea that Philip K. Dick talked about. Now, Maybe. what makes it a little weird to us is the fact that you ran into him again I know. shortly after this in a completely different context in the city across the water over the bridge where the odds for you to meet him would be very, very low. And and the manner in which you arrived at that destination was confusing and not something that could have been predicted, except and, maybe by, unless it's someone right. who is manipulating you or mm-hmm. has the ability to know things about space and time, like a remote right. viewer would. Like some someone like the great Pat Price, but only maybe even better, like an alien would. Right. <laughs> can go, he right? Can he like, see my cool. thoughts? No. Can he right. influence me? Because let me just point this out as well. It was how he acknowledged me when I was leaving the shop. Like a normal person would have been like, oh, my God, I'm seeing you again or I'm following you or make some silly joke. Right. About it. He, all he did was give me this like mm-hmm. well the fact that you didn't say anything i mean you must have wondered like why did i not say anything it's like you could have said what are you doing here like it would have been a normal reaction but you you, did, you didn't say anything you were just flummoxed or you yeah, just I, were what do you think what do you I, think I, that was i can just say typical of me is two types of reactions one or the other like one is like I'll make a joke like hey blah 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 I'll make some silly comment you Mm -hmm. know like are you following me or you know like just be friendly or I'll be in so much shock that I'll just keep walking and I'll want to think about it on my own in the car right like you know that of me like I'll yeah Sometimes I don't know what to say in a situation and people will misinterpret how I mean it. But I just I go away by myself and I think about what just happened. And that was the situation yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were where just, I, I just kind of was so taken uh, how and it was just that he he was in my path almost like so I would see him. And the part I cannot convey to you guys was the look and the nod like he knew I was going to be there. He was expecting it. it. That's how it felt. Like he was expecting it. I think, I mean, we don't know how to make sense of your no. experience. I mean, the bottom line is I we don't, just don't know. How to I do don't it. know how to make sense of um, it, honestly. But I keep coming back to one thing. Like when you wonder about things like other dimensions and things like the multiverse, like they're, they're string theory and they'll talk about 11 dimensions or whatever number they got themselves up to. Of course, th- their idea of dimensions isn't quite like the idea of dimensions that people like us, like non-physicists have. But but it is the fact that we all know we perceive our reality through our senses and we make sense of our reality through the kinds of brains that we have. And those have limitations. Like we have five official senses, you know, what are they? Touch, hearing, smell, taste, and sight, right? Yes. And then we talk about a sixth sense, which I believe we have. You believe we have, of course. Mm-hmm. But how strong is that sense? And and what, what does that sixth sense actually detect? Like, that's just a very nebulous uh, thing to begin with as well. But there's something else there. I guess my point is that we have, we have certain well-defined senses and other senses that are maybe not so well-defined, but we've, we've got them. And then we have a certain ability to interpret the the inputs that come into us and those are limited well those there include, is right so yeah i, I totally our, agree i just want to add to that that there yeah. is some research about the 17 subtle senses and i know that ingo swan talked about those as well i think in either his presentations or one of his books yeah but, um, but that doesn't change my point simply it is doesn't that we change have a limited saying. ability we have we have a good ability but it still has limits of how we perceive and interpret reality so yeah i keep thinking you know there there has i think that there's something well beyond what we're able to perceive and this is where i think aliens uh have definitely an advantage over us because they seem to have larger brains that have passed a a certain threshold of being able to perceive whether it's 
realities such as the relationship of space and time or what we call dimensions. I don't know, but maybe or maybe both and maybe more. So they can manipulate those realities in ways that we can't. But now what's interesting is that this guy that you met, I mean, he's a total human being. He's just, just like us, I assume. So and he, he didn't, seemed that way. If he was telling you the truth and he didn't have the ability to go back to his world. So somehow. Like it would have been nice to find out, like, how the hell did you get here? You guys have this technology to do interdimensional banishments like this, apparently. Um, yeah, he was very clear that he felt they were punishing him for something. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I think it's an interesting idea. And it's kind of relevant, you know, for the UFO subject in for obvious ways. I mean, when we talk about who are these beings, where do they come from, what are they, where are they? Like, I, I wonder this, too. Like, where is their infrastructure? Do they have, is it all in underground bases? Is it under under the sea bases? Is it inside mountains? That's definitely a theory that I believe is true. Like, I do think that there are bases that are hidden away on this planet. And there very likely could be bases under the surface of nearby worlds like the moon or even Mars. I think entirely possible. I mean, with the manner in which these craft are able to move i don't think that that's a great obstacle the only limitation would be can you create a, a viable livable place under the surface of, of the moon or mars but definitely you can do it on earth so i think that there are physical bases here but a real question is are they coming from another dimension of reality and i keep thinking we both watched uh the documentary done by jeremy corbell on skinwalker ranch Mm-hmm. And uh, what, that was actually very heavily borrowing off the work of George Knapp, of course. And you have that one mm-hmm. moment where, you know, apparently they're they're seeing, literally seeing an opening in the reality where a being mm-hmm. is coming through mm-hmm. the reality. And I think I told this to you and I, I may have said this uh, at one point or another to members of the site, but even before I published my first book. I remember I was interviewing, uh, I was doing a professional resume. I did a lot of those. But this one woman who discovered I was a UFO researcher, I wasn't yet published, but I was serious. And she said, oh, I have to tell you about the experience I had in Hawaii. And she had a boyfriend in Hawaii back in 1973. So that would be more than 20 years before I met. I met her in 97. Okay. So in 73, she's in Hawaii. And I don't remember which island. She, I don't know if she told me. And they're having a, like a romantic evening around a hillside looking at the stars. And she said, and, and we both saw this. It was like a door, a white door opening in the sky. It just opened a large door. Like this is out of, they had this on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Or you go through the wormholes or one of those Star Trek <laughs> where you, you did yeah. thing opens up. And she said, and as she told me this story, by the way, she got so animated. She actually stood up and she's moving back and forth across the wow. room, like describing it with her arms and her body. And she's like, and and it was, oh, it opened up. It was super bright. And then after about five seconds, it just closed up. Wow. And I looked at him. He looked at me like we both saw it. And I don't know what that, like, there's no question about believing her. Mm-hmm. Like any okay. anyone in the world who listened to her would be like, I believe you. She was very professional. I don't remember what she did for a living, but there'd be no reason you would not believe her. So, and I've often wondered, did you see an opening in reality? That's what it looks like. That's what it seemed like. She did not see anything come in or out of it. Like I asked her explicitly. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. But, um, Anyway, in, Jer- there, there in Jeremy smoke. Corbell's story, I, I believe someone something did come out of it, correct? A being. Yeah, a being came a out of it. A being came out of this opening. Yeah. 